So my topic is about the transfer of dental student skills from the haptic to the conventional simulation environment. So just to give you a brief overview and a brief background, so normally what uh, the graduate training program for dentistry at WA is called as the DMD, Doctorate of Clinical Medicine. So these are the students that comes here within the dental degree to do a four year of degree program. And prior to their admission within this program, the selection criteria is that they should have completed at least three to four years of their bachelor degree. So some of them are really very highly qualified. So in addition to that, that they should be excellent in the academics, there's nothing else that we normally require them. The problem that we face is as a dentist, we actually require the manual dexterity skills. So we work with our hands and our drilling and all these things are actually very important to be a dentist and we don't really check it prior to the admission into the dental school. So, so the problem is that the introduction of the manual dexterity skills to these fairly academically bright students is a bit of a challenge. So where, how do we do it? We use it two simulation environments. One is the convention simulation, the one here. We basically use a phantom head and then the teeth are basically present within the mouth and then they do the drilling with a handpiece with all these artificial teeth. That's the conventional way. The one that has been newly introduced and is relatively new is known as Simodon, the one here. So these Simodons are basically haptic dental drilling skill trainer system. What it does, it, it is basically fully virtual. So, and they, they use the handpiece, they use their foot pedal, and they are drilling within the teeth. They feel the resistance and all these things, the, what they feel within the natural environment. So, and it also, the most important thing it does is it gives them a feedback. So rather than in simulation, we need a tutor, and we get a, a tutor-based feedback, it's a fixed feedback. So the more you drill, the better you drill, you get the feedback from the computer. So where do we normally use it? So when they come within the first year, we have a number of modules. From first year is the manual dexterity module, in which each student basically receives 10 hours of the manual dexterity skills. And these are the different tasks that they have to do, depending on the shape, starting from a simple one like an eye. So it's just a simple eye shape, then they move on to the cross, donuts, and all these things as they learn. And they normally start with a direct vision, and remember, we have to use indirect vision in a mirror when we are working on the upper teeth. So progressively, they move to the difficult task. Then they do the training in the second semester as well as a part of a karyology module. And for second and the third years is the either with the beats, some of the difficult cases of beats, as well as karyology. Final year, basically, this is the time after that they move out into the clinical environment and they are work as an individual. What they do is that they do the crown preparation. So this is a dental simulator. So all these, what we have is our four uh, Simodon stations. Each station basically consists of a 3D screen where you can wear up the 3D glasses and look at what's happening. And also it has a monitor which gives you um, actually the feedback what it is looking like. So this is the 3D screen. So if you look here, we have a handpiece and there's a selection of the birds that we put into the handpiece and they drill it. And they can also use the mirror, like as I said, the direct vision and indirect vision, we require it. And then we have a foot pedal where they control it and they feel it, what they are doing it. They feel the resistance they see, and they see it. They move the image in and they can see the mistake. And above all, what they get is, is a feedback from the computer. So if you look clearly in this shape that is known as like it's a donut shape, that's the one that we use in our research. What it does is basically the red area here is the target area. That's the area where they should be drilling. And the area, green area, that's surrounding it is a leeway. Leeway is around the side as well as at the bottom. So basically, they should be drilling in the target area. That's what, thinking about teeth, they should be drilling basically the decay, not the actual tooth. So if they go out of this target area and go into the leeway, this is 
Okay, absolutely fine. But if they go into this container area, that's a normal tooth st structure, it's a no-no zone. That's what we tell them. No, why? You don't have to drill out the natural tooth. Okay, so what it basically does, the feedback, so it gives them, if you look at the task here, they have to complete 60% of the drilling, and they have to do in the target area, a little bit in the leeway is fine, but this container should always be zero when they are doing this drilling. Okay. So for our research, our sample size, what we selected, our first year DMD students, when they come and the module that they run is the manual dexterity module. So normally they receive 10 hours of the training. So once they receive five hours of the training, it is the time that we decided to take them out from the haptic lab and move them to the simodont, the conventional simodont, and see what they do in there. So we actually had a plastic um, tooth structure that's really a plastic actually um, sheet that basically have the same structure what we did drill in the haptic environment. So this is what they have used into the conventional simulation. And if you look here, so uh, these two are the leeway areas. They shouldn't really be drilling in this one. And they had two of these tasks that they need to complete it. So our aims were basically to look at the task, what they have done in the haptic, and is it any learning thing? And these tasks can be successfully transferred to a conventional simulation lab? Is there any improvement in the learning? And also to investigate the correlation between the age and the other demographic characteristics, like the, as I said, they have prior degrees as well. Does it affect or not? So, so as I said, the sample size was this. The total number was 57. This is the number of the student we get in the first year. And then after five years of the training, they moved into the uh, conventional simulation. They do their drilling. And once they drilled that, we took out these blocks, we scanned them, and then we used our software image to analyze the roundness of the scale and measure the area that's, that was required. And then we analyzed the data using our analyzing software. So what we normally say is that the area that sh they should be drilling, we just categorized it. So the normal range, it should be 30 to this one here. This is the range if they, have, they, they stay within this range, either with one task, we consider them as pass. Otherwise, it's a fail. So what we figured out, it was about 63% of the student, basically they were able to cut an acceptable shape into the conventional simulation after working into the haptic environment. And to our surprise, they could do it within the 10 minutes, while the same students were basically taking three hours to cut the same shape in the haptic. So the training actually helped. So this is when we look at the gender and the other specific, 100% of our male students were able to do it, they passed, and 90% of the females as well. So, and looking at the previous degree, the student that had basically the degree in the health sciences, 100% of them, they passed. And the one, the non-sciences, it's the percentage was about 83%. The students with the science degree, about 96 of them, they also passed as well. So what does, just to summarize, so what does these results show? Basically, this, is, this project is actually started the investigation to characterize and explain the ability to achieve the success with the manual dexterity task. And we have seen that we have, they were successful in terms of their drilling as well as in terms of the timing. So it worked really well. And there was no correlation significant regarding their age or degree of previous degree or other things. All right, we definitely know that we do need an improved sample size and also how it's gonna help in future. Basically, it can help in our selection criteria and that's what we did in an open day. We took the simodons and the interesting parents as well as the uh, students, like they came and they've practiced their skills in haptic environment and they really liked it. And they asked us the question, what do we need to come to the dental school. It's in addition to your academic records, that's what you need. Thank you. I would like to thank WA Clinical Training Network for funding this project, and thank you all. Can I ask a question? Yes, I think it was in this very room, Jeff will remember. Was it Rick Satava, professor of surgery, who was talking about laparoscopic skills, and he said, uh, the time is coming, we will evaluate applicants for surgical training by 
having them try and translate two-dimensional images into three-dimensional, and those that fail won't be accepted for surgical training. We can't waste our time with people who can't learn these skills. If they don't have the, uh, the dexterity, why should we? But they can go and do psychiatry or some other thing, but they don't need to be doing surgery. So what, what, what's, if your research shows that you, some people don't get it and some people do get it, are you going to move in that direction? So what my research shows that with training it can improve. So everybody is different. I wouldn't say that yeah, some of the dentists have different manual dexterity skills and it improves with time, some it doesn't. So that's what we have to train them. So rather than using that conventional training, it costs us quite a lot of money. Each tooth ranges from eight to 30. So for this instrument, Haptic, like we bought it just for once, but it is like, you know, they can use it any time. So Normally they get 10 hours, but if they require additional training, we give them additional time as well. So it does help them. So yeah, I think we can improve their skills. Well, they can become an academic. They can come into yeah. academics. <laughs> <laughs> we are not able to help. <laughs> um, perhaps I could let you in on a little meeting I had with Gary Gilho, the um, chief medical officer last week, when I met him for other reasons. I mentioned that the group, the ILS, uh, has been overseeing research. And he was quite surprised at that. He said, what sort of research? And I said, simulation-based research. And he said, can you give me some examples of the topics that you've um, sponsored, if you like, or given seed money, seed grants to? And he, uh, he was quite fascinated. He said, I thought you'd be talking about millions of dollars. He said, you're doing all this with, with, uh, with small grants. So he was quite... Um, impressed, I'd have to say, and I don't use that word uh, a lot, but he was very impressed with what's being done in Western Australia with, uh, with just a little bit of money. So I, I think it's a credit to all of you who are taking your time to do research in this field because especially in the, um, the presentation on the introduction of a new physiotherapy curriculum, for example, you know, if we don't, if we don't research the outcomes of it, in 10 years' time, when the time comes to say, what did you do with that money, can you show any differences? I think it's fantastic that we can.